Good morning. Welcome to Monrovia this morning. We are so glad that you've chosen to come and be with us as we worship together and we remind each other that salvation belongs to our God. Let's all stand and sing out this morning. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks. Singing for 
for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You're my Savior. You can move the mountains. God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever, author of salvation. You rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Be seated, please. Our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this nation that you've given us that allows us to come and worship you in peace and tranquility. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. And as we've start, we were just saying, we know that we all need, our, need your mercy and your salvation. And Father, as you've blessed us so much, we pray that you would help us give unto those in the world who are not blessed. Provide them with your fruits of your blessings that you've given to us back to them. And Father, we ask that all the Christians in the world that are under persecution, that you would protect them and soften the hearts of the persecutors and allow them to also live in peace and tranquility. Thank you, Father, for this time, for this worship. And bless us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will join together and take the Lord's Supper in just a moment. If you don't have your emblems, please raise your hand while we sing, and we'll bring those out to you. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God. Full atonement can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was He to die. It is finished, was His cry. Now in heaven exalt. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When He comes, our glorious King, all His ransomed home to bring, then unto this song we'll sing. Hallelujah. for me. I'm going to try to read from an iPad while holding a microphone in front of a whole bunch of people. Uh, 
I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, if you would like to turn over to Romans chapter 5. I was trying to find the right things to say, uh, and uh, I couldn't, I'm sorry, got it. I was trying to find the right things to say, and realized the things I wanted to say uh, was really summed up in the things that are in Romans chapter 5. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to cover before then, uh, to just get you oriented. Romans was written to people who had been at, uh, in, who are, Paul is writing to Roman Christians that include people who were at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And so they have been Christians from the very first day. But there's Gentiles also in that congregation. And so how does the, old te- how does the Mosaical law work in this new covenant that we have. And uh, so when he talks about the law, he's talking about the Mosaical law. When he talks about the commands, he's talking about the commandments that were under the Mosaical law. And then of course there was a time before the Mosaical law that people uh, were living, and so he covers that also. There's the word sin. Sin has to do with missing the target. So what is the target that we're supposed to be uh, hitting? The target we're supposed to be hitting is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the target. And so uh, when you hear sin, now, it, think, if you're thinking archery, if you're not, if you don't have a target, how do you hit a target? But the target was you know, obey God's command, and his command is love the Lord your God and love your neighbors. <clears throat> so, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? Oh, excuse <laughs> That's chapter 6, uh, chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace that we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, that at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received now, uh, now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in the same way death came to all people, because all people sinned, to be sure, Sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who had did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, for he is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if uh, the many died by the trespass of one man, 
how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift be compared with the results of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for uh, people, for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also the, uh, through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. Let us bow. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the great gift that you have given us. We thank you for that salvation, the righteousness, the forgiveness of our sins, the life that we have in you through the sacrifice that Jesus made. Father, help us to be in awe of Jesus, who, though we were sinners, died so that we could have a life with you. These things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Let us bow for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the sacrifice that was made and for the cleansing that we have through the blood of Jesus. Help us to remember uh, that we have been sent cleansed from our sins, that we have been reconciled to you, and we have a home in heaven to you, uh, with you. And you walk with us and are at our right hand through the, all the steps of our life. These things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. With COVID, uh, things changed the way uh, we used to pass the plate around, but now we don't do that anymore. So uh, you can give through Breeze, or uh, there's a plate out in the hallway that you can uh, leave your contribution. Uh, please uh, consider the blessings that God has given you and uh, share those blessings with other people. Thank you. it on maybe it works better good morning again good to see everybody uh family time we took a few minutes uh, if you're visiting with us at, at this time and uh just talk about a variety of things going on in our family um we typically mention a few people who have just some uh, variety of things happening in their life right now and want to mention daniel and sherlyn daniel's back here with us today everybody turn around and wave at daniel hey there yeah good to have daniel today Keep Joe and Donna continuing your prayers as they, uh, you know, Joe with his back and other issues, Donna <coughs> uh, continuing her treatment, Bernie, uh, keep him in your prayers. Wendell was saying this morning that uh, the uh, drainage and the shunt they put in has, they, has really helped. They believe that is going to uh, solve the problems he was having with disorientation and balance and some of those. So that's, that's really good, uh, good news for them. Faye Thompson has had a couple of surgeries this week, and one of them, I understand, was very invasive where they went into her back and took a lot of the hardware that was in there before and replaced, so uh, you know, she's recovering from the surgery, and then certainly there'll be physical therapy uh, to come on top of that. Debbie Harlow's had a, a rough week, 
Uh, she had a, a stroke earlier in the week and has been treated with that. Uh, just some, that, that was a really, really bad time. But also this week she lost her brother-in-law who had been uh, struggling with COPD uh, and been in hospice care. But still, anytime a family member passes, that's tough. So, uh, again, keep them in mind. I, I mention every week, look in the bulletin. There's a number of other people mentioned uh, that have just some sickness and things they're struggling with, as well as some shut-ins. I want to say hey and uh, encourage everybody to say hey to Nancy Acuff. Good to see her. Phil's been with us uh, for quite some time. Nancy has not been able to come uh, because of treating the Michael. That's I said that right. Z A Michael. Z Michael, and uh, he's had to have a, a number of things with an arm and some nerve grafts and just a lot going on. And so that's kept Nancy at home uh, taking care of him. And now they'll begin the physical therapy with Zemichael, uh for the next extended period of time. But it's really good to see Nancy uh, out with us. Today, uh, it was mentioned our contribution. Uh, you can give online, like I said. You can give up front. Also out front, there's uh, some cards where you can make pledges today. Everything that is either given or pledged today goes strictly toward our missions, and we've put the budget in front of you, $60,000. You can see the breakdown. Uh, again, you know, you, it's not necessary to give it all today, but whatever is given today and pledged, it really helps the mission committee to be able to know, okay, this is what we anticipate will be will be coming in this year with our individual contributions, so what other things might need to be done or planned or, you know, attempt to try to make sure we raise the 60000 I mentioned last week why that is so important is, well, it's important to raise the money, but commitments have already been made for these. It's not like we're taking the money and then we'll figure out what to do with it later. We've already committed to these people that uh, in, in, you know, in mission efforts that that's what we're going to do, so we're going to follow through on that. And your help today would really be great. Baja mission trip is coming up. They're still working on some of the details. Again, if you have any thoughts of going, Mike Gunnels or Brian Walton, uh, let them know so they they can be making plans for how many people will be there and what all they uh, want to try to accomplish. The closet it's coming up. Uh, so now we're taking spring and summer donations. So anything you have that you can help out with that, please bring those, uh, put them up front. And so they can be sorted and, and made ready uh, for that time of year. Next week, there'll be a shower for, look at there, Carter Ray Palmer. I wonder where they got that name. They, they should have been Ray Carter Palmer. Right? And just that's, that's just what I thought. But I, they didn't ask my opinion. Uh, anyway, the big shower, uh, recognition for them. I'm telling you, uh, Spencer and Hannah, they, they got all the stuff they need, but their grandparents could use some stuff. So I think that's still appropriate at showers. Anything you want to give me and Christy to help out, that'd be wonderful. All right. Uh, seriously, th they'll be here next week. I'm really excited. I'll say more about this when we get to the lesson. But uh, since they're going to be here, I asked Spencer if he would speak next week. He has really been very studious of, and he and Hannah have uh, been committed to Sabbath uh, practice, and I don't mean like being a Jew and observing all the Sabbath, but he will share a lot of what that is next week. We're going to introduce that thought in Sabbath and rest today, as you remember, we're going back to the beginning and looking at that. So it's going to be neat that he can build on what we, we talk about, so he'll, he'll be speaking next Sunday. Valentine's dinner coming up, February 13th. We always appreciate Dan and Terra Nova and everything they do. As we said, this is another one of our mission efforts. Uh, you need to sign up, show up, be wonderful food, uh, food as good as you can get anywhere, be entertainment, not sure if the entertainment's as good as you can get everywhere, nothing to the, the I'm serious, uh, we'll have fun, all right, and then that night we ask you to give also, uh, give the price you would pay for food and even more, everything that you can because everything given because of Grant Dan's graciousness, everything given that night will go toward that $60,000 mission. Stay and eat lunch. We always encourage you to enjoy the fellowship and time together. I'm going to try this. I think it's chicken carob... I call it chicken spaghetti. Y'all can call it whatever you want to. That's what it looks like to me, right? But that, that's what it is. Chicken... Carbonara. Carbonara. All right. Not, all right. I can, I've never ordered that in a restaurant. Have you? Dan, do you serve chicken carbonara? Some... Okay. All right. All right, stay green beans, 
uh, salad, and I think there's some kind of ice cream cake for dessert, so uh, encourage you to stay and participate in that. We've been recognizing a family uh, each week. Today we're recognizing Misty, Misty's back there, Misty Crab, original member of uh, Monrovia, her and her family. Uh, she was here for many years. Uh, that's, I read in there that you taught Sarah, uh, Sarah's that age group from three-year-old all the way up to third grade, right? So spent a lot of years with that age group of kids. Uh, and so Misty's back at Monrovia now, and we're happy to have her, and she's very engaged and involved with our youth group. Uh, we're very excited about that. Misty has a couple of kids, Maggie and Lucas, who are back there. They're with us today. Lucas and Maggie live in uh, Mobile, right? In, uh, is that right? Yeah, all right, Mobile. And, and they're involved with campus outreach and really involved in the university. And that, that is, both of them are committed and involved in that. Uh, and that's wonderful. And her, uh, Misty also has a son named Will, who I, I believe is a senior at uh, UNA and studying criminal justice and looking at what he might do uh, with that. So uh, give him a hand. <laughs> wonderful. Andrea back there put together some slides that I want to put in front of you, and this is just some ways, opportunities you have to get connected. Some, there's a lot of things going on, and we don't always talk about it and uh, mention some of the variety of things, but there's classes here on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. There's a class in the gathering room and in the fellowship hall if you're interested in participating in one of those Bible studies. Also on Sunday morning, uh, here we have a nursery class. Nursery, toddler, pre-K, first through five, and six through eight, and we'll be dismissing those to go to class here in just a moment. So there's that class opportunity during this time. On Sunday nights at 5 p.m., the MAC meets for dinner and study, and there's Bible classes for toddlers and one through six. Also, the youth, grade seven through 12, they do a variety of things. Typically, it's dinner and Bible classes in the loft, and the college class has dinner and class upstairs, that's on Sunday nights, all right? On Wednesday nights, there's a small group at our house. The MAC meets for dinner and devotion. There's a bridge group that meets in room 11, and there's an adult class in the conference room and a ladies class also at 645. So there's a lot of things going on. And uh, again, I mentioned there's a group at our house. Anybody that ever wants to become a part of our, or, you know, or start coming to our house on Wednesday night, just reach out to Mayor Christie. We'd love to have you. Uh, we've had some people that, for a variety of reasons, have uh, moved on or doing something different right now, like Wendy Wallace, uh, who, who was here, moved to South Huntsville and is somewhere else. So, th so we have, uh, you know, we, we could uh, accommodate a few more people if anyone's interested. And also, all of these classes, there's just, again, a variety of ways for you to participate and be involved. All right, I'm tired now. As Ray mentioned, we have classes for nursery up through eighth grade, so we'll dismiss them at this time. And then those of us that remain, let's stand and sing out. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Oh, Blessed Redeemer, 
I know I say this every week, but we got a lot of ground to cover today, so we're going to get busy. We're going back to the beginning of man, when man, Adam and Eve were created, learning from their design, their creation. God created them in his image, learning from that what we can apply into our lives today. Today we're going to talk about rest. How many like to rest? All right, so we're going to talk about rest. Uh, when I got to thinking about it, this and was preparing for it, I ran across this statement from a, a guy that I used to know when he was a little kid, Jeremy Marshall, who was up in North Carolina now, and he had put this on his uh, Facebook page. It said, when I preach or teach or counsel or write, I pray that everyone knows I am not speaking from a reservoir of my strength or successes. No, I preach from my own weakness. My doubts illuminate my writing. My ignorance drives me to study. My counsel is the texture of my scar tissue. I like that. And what he's really saying is if you will listen to people that preach or teach or write, what they preach, teach, and write about are typically the things they struggle with the most. All right? Most, and I'm talking about people that are really sincere in what they do, you'll find that coming through their talking and their teaching, their writing, whatever it is, because it, it is really it's where they spend their time because that's their struggle. Tattoo. The lab, uh, basset hound. Tattoo the basset hound. He did not know he was going to go on the walk that he ended up going on that morning. Had no idea, but when his owner shut the car door and the leash was inside the car door and the owner took off down the road, Tattoo the basset hound went for the walk of his life. Uh, it, it, interesting that Carrie Filbert, this is a true story happened up in Spokane, Washington. Carrie Filbert, a policeman, saw what was happening, pulled the driver over and said that Tattoo the Basset Hound was picking those feet up and putting them down just as fast as he can. But even at that, he rolled over two or three times. They had reached speeds up to 25 miles an hour in this small residential neighborhood. Fortunately, Tattoo was not hurt. He was not injured and he survived. But they said he never was really excited about going on a walk again. I, I fully get that, but I want to tell you that story. Say, so how many times have you felt like Tattoo the Basset Hound, like your leash of life is attached to something that's just pulling you, and the best you can do is pick your feet up and put them down just as fast as you can, and even at that, you still stumble and you still roll over because you just can't stay caught up. Now, here's the deal, and this is the truth of us. For some reason, we like to be busy. And those of you in work environments know that a lot of people, especially up in, you know, the higher up, they, they love it when their calendar is just packed full. I mean, and we we'll even talk about how tired we are, and you know, we just, you know, we we never can rest. It's just I'm just running from one thing to the next. And here's the dark secret in that. And folks, listen, let's be honest with ourselves. All right, I encourage you today, be honest with yourself. You you know, there's something about being busy. The dark secret to that is it makes us feel important. For some reason, when our day is packed full of meetings or obligations, we feel like we're in court. It, it, it's sort of ingrained into us because of our culture. That, you know, successful people are the ones that are what? That are always, I mean, they, you, you, they're just here and they're, they're, they're all over the place. They are just, you know, really busy. And it, it, it's just in us to be that way. The preacher told one of his leaders, he said, I want you to know I never take a day off because the devil never takes a day off. The leader looked right back at him and he said, you know, I would encourage you to get a better role model. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's simply a lot of truth in that. The little mother she was trying to teach her kids about creation. And so she was telling them what happened on every day. And then she would ask them, you know, if they knew, okay, day one, do you know what happened? And she would explain to them. And, and day two, and, you know, one of the little boys, he, he said, I know, I know what happened on day seven. She said, we're not there yet. And so she gets to like day three. And he said, I know what happened on day seven. And so finally she said, okay, tell me what happened on day seven. She said, that's when Jesus got arrested. We walk through our lives a lot of times, and really it's life has arrested us. It's taken us captive to, again, the culture and the way it works. 
you know, right? That, that's sort of the way our society works, isn't it? Is we're continually being asked to do something, to participate in something, to obligate ourselves to something, and a lot of that's good. A lot of it's good. And for many of us, one of our biggest struggles is the ability to say no. To say no. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1 said, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, when you read that, it sort of sounds like, and you know, you you could read into that. Well, I mean, God, yeah, I mean, he worked really hard for six days. I get it. And after six days of hard work, what did he need to do? Needed to rest. He was tired. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26 or 28 says this Do you not know? Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will what? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. We're going to talk a little bit about this rest ideal today. I'm not going to really get into this part because, as I told you, Spencer is going to speak next Sunday, and he'll cover more of that. We're going to look at a couple of things at the end. But the rest is not... Like Jesus after or God and you know the Father, we went to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, the, doing all the creation. It wasn't like they were tired on the sixth or the seventh day and needed to take a day off of rest. All right. Rest is not to not do something. The rest that's being talked here is resting to something. It's resting towards something, not resting from something. All right. And now we need to rest from things, but Really, and we'll, we'll again, Spencer will build on this all more next week, but it's the resting to something that is really significant about the Sabbath day that God established. Now, you have to understand when this was given, when this wording, this writing came from the Spirit into the world, the world at that time was very wrapped up into Greek mythology and all that kind of thinking and thought was out there. And the way they envisioned this is that there were multiple gods and really all the society, all the people were sort of like their toys in this big God world that they're fighting. And what they're doing is they're continually at battle with each other over the world, over all these people and whose they are and who's they're going to claim. You see, this is like in the spirit world out there, the way the people saw it is there was this great battle going on for them. Now, this writing comes into play, and it talks about a singular God making everything, and then once he's made it all, he looks out and says, it's good. It's good. He's not anxious about anything. He's not nervous about other entities or gods or you you see what I'm saying? So this writing, when it came to these people, when it came to God's people, was totally at odds with everything that they thought about the gods and how things work. Genesis 2, 3, we read, look what it said. It said, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now, if your thought has already gone to, I get it, and I don't know why Spencer's going to come and even talk about Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath day was something that the the Israelites had that, you know, God gave as remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I've known all along, I've I've learned this from a young age, that we don't do the Sabbath. We do the first day of the week. That's the Lord's day now. Sabbath day is gone. Well, I first challenge you to find somewhere that God set aside the first day of the week is more sacred than any other day. The only day God has ever blessed and made holy was the seventh day, all right? But it wasn't about the day. It's not about the day. It's about what he was blessing people to participate in and be a part of. That is what is significant. Now, it was specifically to do this on this day during that period of time. I understand that, all right? We're not going to get wrapped in that, but I, I don't want you to get lost in... And, and, and not paying attention to this thought of rest 
because it was something way back there. In fact, we're going to look at a verse in a minute that will help us with that. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. There was evening and there was morning the third day. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. There was evening and there was morning the fifth day. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. There was not evening and morning the seventh day. That rhythm of days did not go with the seventh day and the blessing associated with it. Look at this. We can't, we're not going to get too deep into this. I just want you to get it. You, okay, book of Hebrews. We understand Hebrews, when you know, we're, we're thinking the, the, the church has now been established, we're thinking you know, past the Old Testament, past the commandments and all that, right? He, the book of Hebrews, we get that. That's, that, that's us, right? Y'all, y'all with me, what I'm saying? Look at chapter 4. It says in verse 3, For we who have believed enter the rest. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter it. Going down to verses 9 and 10, it says, So then a Sabbath rest, look at this, a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience is theirs. From the Mirror Study Bible, verses 9 and 10, it says, The conclusion is clear. The original rest is still in place for God's people. God's rest celebrates his finished work. Whoever enters into God's rest immediately abandons his own efforts to improve what God has already perfected. Let us, therefore, be prompt to understand and fully appropriate that rest and not fall again into the same trap that snared Israel in unbelief. Here's the deal. The kind of rest that God was encouraging and putting in place and hoping the children of Israel would enter into, we are encouraged, prompted, asked to enter into that same rest today. Okay? And that's why this is so key. And again, to understand what the Sabbath was about. What what was it? It wasn't just not doing stuff, all right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 and 9. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residents in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but the but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. All right? So there was a day set aside, and he, again, we'll we'll see more. It wasn't to not do stuff as it was to do something, and it was, you know, for a purpose. But in order for you, and this is what you got to get, folks, in order for you to do that, there are some things you can't do. You get it? I can't be blessed to this rest while I'm laboring and trying to bring about my own perfection. I have to learn to rest in God's perfection, not in what I might bring about. Here's the deal. If creation did not crash when God rested, it will not crash when you do. You get that? I mean, we think the company won't make it or the family won't make it or this team won't make it or whatever it is. I'm pretty sure if God was able to look at it the entire world and said, you know what, we can just take this day and not have to be engaged in any particular activity, you can probably do the same thing, all right? The problem was this was given to the children of Israel, and I put this picture up here because of their time in slavery, all right, their time in slavery. How many years did they spend in Egypt in slavery? 400 years. How many days a week do you think they worked when they were in slavery? Seven days a week. How many hours a day do you think they worked? Probably from sunup to sundown. Sometimes before sunup and sometimes after sundown. The point was they had worked. (coughs) Their parents had worked. Their grandparents had worked. Their grand-grandparents had worked. Their great-great-grand whatever you know what I mean. For 400 years, these families have known nothing but work. Pharaoh had so guided their every thought and their every activity, and it's to these people that God then says, rest. 
take a day off. And we're going to bless this day. It's going to be a holy day. It's going to be an exciting thing that's going to take, you know, what, what, what's going to take place is all going to be exciting. Here's the problem today is we have, how long have we been in the United States now? What? 200 and something years? You know, 300 years? I mean, we're, we're approaching that 400 years, you know. But, and what has been the culture is work, work, work. You got to work. When you're not working, you got to work, right? And work may be not just at your job, but what you got to be busy. You got to be busy. And you, so we are subject to the Pharaoh of our thought process that says, I have to be busy. I've got to be busy. I've got to be doing something. I mean, and I'll go back to what, you know, the very first slide I said, I'm preaching what I struggle with. I struggle with it. It is hard for me not to be busy. I need to not be busy in order to do what it is. Here, here's the problem. When I'm busy, I am subject to my culture rather than my creator. You understand that? Busyness is not of God. Doesn't mean that we're godless when we're busy. But busyness is not of God. It's our culture. Rest. learning to lean into the rest that he can provide. That is of God. How many of you have ever heard of the domino sparrow? It's, I'm just full of information today. I'm sorry. All right. The domino sparrow in the Netherlands, they, okay, people do this. It's a big deal. They, they, they are continuing. always trying to do this is set up dominoes and see how many, who, who can have the most dominoes, all right, that fall down, all right? So in the Netherlands, many years ago, I think it was in 1993 or something like that, but they, they, they were going to break the world's record. The world record at that time was 4 million dominoes. So they had set up 4 million dominoes, and they're ready for the day that this is going to take place, and these 4 million dominoes are going to fall. But somebody left a window open, and a sparrow had come in and had knocked a domino down. In the middle of these 4 million dominoes, by the way, they couldn't get the sparrow out of there. This is a, a, it goes into a whole big deal. So they end up shooting the sparrow. Comes out, this is on a, like a species that's you know, about to go extinct. And so now they end up with a whole court proceedings over shooting the sparrow. I mean, it gets to be a big deal. But here's the, the purpose of the story. Is it only knocked down 25,000 dominoes of the 4 million. You know why? Because in this setup, they had put 750 different spacers. You get it? Spacers. So if something like this happened or some accident happened and it knocked a domino down, it wouldn't take it all down. There would be a place, it, it's going to knock 25,000 down, but guess what? Then it's going to stop because there is a reset. The purpose of that story is you and I also need a reset in our life. This is part of God's rest part of his sabbath is you get out there and you go all week we go all week and then we go another week and then we go another week and we go another week right and we're, we're you know we run the car to us completely out of gas i don't know why it is that in life and so for for so many of us in the united states we have to have a breakdown before we can have a breakthrough did you know that really we have to push ourselves so hard to where you have a breakdown, and only then do we have a breakthrough. And God is saying, I want you to put intentional spacers into your life to where you can have breakthroughs at regular intervals so you can keep going so we don't have to have the breakdown. Here's a, I'm just going to give you quickly three reasons why we need this rest. One is to preserve our limited resources. We have very limited resources. You might think you can go and go and go, but you can't. You're killing yourself. You are killing yourself. Physically, mentally, emotionally, and you're putting your life and the lives of people around you at risk. Here's, here's a guy that lived that way. He lived his whole life that way. When he was at the age of 53, he was diagnosed with a brain cancer, given three to six months to live. His whole life had been built around Appointments, meetings, successes, all those things. It, it, it's a really interesting story. He wrote a book, uh, Chasing Destiny, I believe was the name of it, Chasing Destiny. But in it, he talks about how he, he drew these circles and he started trying to repair the relationships to get to the inner circle. And in the inner circle was where he had his family and God. And 
all that stuff. You, you, here's what he here's the thing he came down to that I, I, I thought was really neat. He said, I had always been trying to create perfection when I needed to allow myself to be exposed to perfect moments. Perfect moments. We don't have perfect moments in times of busyness because those are task efforts. Perfect moments come in spaces of rest and relationship. That's when you have your perfect moments. He realized that, realized that and he shared way too late. Listen, here's the deal. If we do not understand we were made to rest, we will most likely be laid to, laid to rest before our time. That's a pretty good quote. But it's so true. If you don't understand your need for rest, you're probably going to be laid to rest before your time. Exodus 20 and 10, it says, You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residents in your town. Here's the deal. He said, we need this to preserve our resources, and this has to be a community thing. You know, I can't rest if Christy and Brittany aren't interested in resting. You know what I mean? And we as a fellowship we is the called out. We can't rest if we don't rest. As long as there's somebody out there running and chasing the wind, they're going to drag other people along with them in that same run chasing the same wind when we all need to rest together. And that's what he was trying to tell the children of Israel when he put it in place. He said, no activity by anybody, all right? We're all going to do this together. The little Boy was having his picture made at school. You know, how, do they still do that? You know, like we used to once a year, and they'd bring a photographer, and they only did that to make your mom and dad feel guilty if you didn't buy a bunch of pictures from them, right? Y'all remember that? But the little uh, boy was being photographed, and he asked the little boy, he said, what are you going to do? Or where are you going to be when you grow up? And the little boy said, tired. <laughs> did you know when you look at the Sabbath, it says... If you profane the Sabbath, you're to die. God took this serious. Now, I asked Nikki what this meant. I'll come back with you on this later because I don't know. When the word that is used for profane the Sabbath there, the Hebrew word, that's the only place it's used in the entire Scripture. That's it, one time. And I tried to look it up and find out what it meant. I couldn't find a good good definition. But Mickey, Nikki, I'm sorry, he, he's going to be uh, meeting. He's been talking to some with a Jewish rabbi. I'm pretty sure that Jewish rabbi can help us to understand what it means to profane the Sabbath. I'm not sure. We'll come back to that. But the key here is to understand there was a death penalty associated with it. Now, there were some other violations of the Sabbath where you just got separated from the people, but to profane the Sabbath, whatever that means. It, so, again, it means God took this serious. Up in the Northeast, <clears throat> several years ago, uh, three, now, there have been a number of uh, shipping accidents, these these boats. I don't know if any of y'all ever watched that, like, uh, I don't know where they go get those uh, uh, what do you call those things that we crabs? You know the they, they have TV shows about that. But three of these boats over just a period of a few weeks crashed: the Adriatic, the Cape Fear, and the Beth Bob. They they all had accidents again in a like in a three week period. Crashed ten men died. They found some commonalities in it. One was that there was not a breach of the hull on any of the accidents. So the boat hadn't been damaged. Second one was every captain had more than 10 years of experience. Third, all three of these accidents happened near the end of their journey within 15 miles of their home port. But what they found is two of the boats were severely overloaded and one of the boats had the load not balanced out properly. And so when they went to asking other captains, so they, these things, they, they take these traps. I don't know if you've seen them. These clam traps, these were all clams. They, they, these clam traps weigh 300 pounds each, empty. Full, when they've got their load in them, they can weigh anywhere from a million, I mean, from one to one and a half ton. I mean, that's huge, all right? And they found that three or two of the boats were carrying 10 extra traps. 
And they went around asking the other captains about it, and the other captains, all, yeah, you know, they shrugged their shoulders. What, what, what's, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? And here's what. So this was just common. They all overloaded their, their boats, but guess what? They had all gotten away with it for so long, believing it was safe. That's us. We have overloaded our lifestyle, and we think it's okay because we get away with it. What we don't realize is we're killing ourselves because the spiritual blessing that comes from this blessed rest that should be in our lives is not there. Restlessness, restlessness is godlessness. Did you know that? It really is. So, you know, preserve our resources. You prioritize what is most important. Again, the seventh day is a Sabbath to, and we'll talk about that more next week, Spencer will, to the Lord your God. Restlessness is primarily a spiritual problem. If you're restless, I don't know sometimes there's, there's you know, health imbalances, but typically restlessness is a spiritual problem. Psalm 62 verse 1 says simply this, Truly my soul finds rest in God. We deal a lot, I think most of you know, I deal with uh, aircraft and aircraft litigation associated with accidents. A lot of our accidents, especially in smaller airplanes with pilots that don't have quite as much experience, this happens sometimes in a military aircraft, but not that much. But So you can either be going so fast, this happens more times when you're in the dark or when you're in clouds and you can't see. All right, If you can imagine flying an airplane and you can't see anything outside. There is what's called vertigo, spatial disorientation is what happens. And I know you don't think this is entirely possible, but it is. You could be flying right side up, but your body is telling yourself you're upside down. And you believe you're upside down. All right. If you remember John Kennedy, who died uh, in an aircraft accident off the coast of Martha Vineyard at night, and it's believed this is what happened, spatial disorientation. It can happen, all right? And then the pilot does things that they're not supposed to do. I mean, they'll actually point their airplane into the ground thinking they're climbing, all right? Because they're so disoriented. The point is, if we don't have these markers, if we don't have these spaces for reset, for rest, for this blessing from God, then what happens? You are just like that pilot. You are navigating through life either at such a high speed or in a dark place, and what you're not trusting, the only way that pilot can really know what is true is by looking at the instruments. His body, his mind is telling him everything different than what the instruments say, but the only safe thing for that pilot to do is look at those instruments and fly the aircraft in accordance with what they tell him to do or her to do. You get that? If they do something different, they will probably die. We rush through life at such a fast pace are in such a dark environment, and our instrument is this rest, this time with God. That is our instrument to guide us through our body, our mind, our people around us are telling us all kinds of different things, but you have to go to that place and look at the instrument that God gave you, and that's Him and His Word and time with Him, and you have to trust that. If you don't, what will happen? You will die. I, you may not physically die, but you will spiritually, emotionally, in so many other ways, you will die. And God said, man, you, you got to trust the instrument. Here's my final point. I'll be done. It helps and can point other, people's God, other people to God. Y'all remember the movie Chariots of Fire, Academy War winner, I think back in 1980, something like that. Uh, uh, Eric was the guy's name. Can't tell you his last name now. But he was, he was supposed to run the 100-meter dash in the Olympics. It was all set up for him to do that. And he, he was raised by missionary parents. He was a Christian man. And this was really big deal back in that day. And it, but it came down that the, the race was going to be on a Sunday. And he said, I can't run. Can't do it. Not going to run on Sunday. Neat story, though. He ends up, another guy that already run the 400-meter hurdle said, you can run the 400-meter dash. That's not Eric's race, but they end up swapping, and he gets to run the 400-meter. He actually won the 400-meter, won the gold medal, and that, that's just sort of the story. But the whole deal was, I mean, what, what faith is it? Y'all remember, I mean, like used to, we didn't do anything on Sundays, right? I mean, used to, we were off. Our, our culture has changed so much of that. And I, I'm not saying we need to make Sunday like a day. I'm just saying you need, though, whatever time it is, you need to set aside 
a time of rest. A time, again, not just to not do anything. We'll talk more about that next week, but a time to do something. And here's the, I'll leave you this story and I'm done. Parent had a little kid. This was a string, you know, faithful Jewish parent. And they had their little kid. And he would not. He was not interested in learn, learning anything. No matter what they attempted to teach him, talk to him about learning, you know, the law and all those. He, he had zero interest at all. He rebelled in every way possible. Mordecai, this is a legend told in the Jewish community. An older rabbi was traveling through town, and the parents thought, we've, we've exhausted, we've tried everything else. Let me, let me see. Let me take Mordecai to the rabbi and see if he can help him. And the rabbi said, yeah, just leave him with me for an hour or two and then come back. They did. Came back in an hour or two, took little Mordecai home, and guess what? He was perfect. Well-behaved, well-mannered, whatever they asked him to do, he did it. They went back and they asked the rabbi, they said, what did you do? He said, I put him in my lap, and I put his head up to my chest, and I let him hear my heart. If you will hear the heart of your rabbi, It'll fix all that other stuff you're running and trying to fix. And you can't get it right. Because you've not entered into the rest of the rabbi. Into the rest of the Sabbath. Again, Spencer, we'll talk more about it next week. But I encourage you to think, just this week, pray. Look to God. Think about, God, do I really need, are you encouraging me to set aside some time? Again, not to not do anything, you get that, but to come into your rest. Don't end often with an invitation, but uh, I want you to know we always encourage you to think about your relationship with God. Always encourage you to. If there's anything you feel like you're lacking, that you need assistance with, that you need encouragement with, you need prayer with, our shepherds are always willing. I'm, I'm available. Reach out to somebody. We want to see you in the rest that God has provided. We ask the parents that have small children in class to go pick them up from their teachers. We encourage you to stay and eat and have fellowship together. Let's stand and sing as we close. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord, a common strength when Dismissed.